In this episode of Mind Pump, we answer fitness and health questions asked by listeners like you. Mm -hmm. Now, we open the episode with introductory conversation where we talk about current events, non-fitness topics, and about our lives. Here's what we talked about in this episode. We started by talking about space travel. Yeah. <laughs> talking about people who want to fly I to Mars. wait. Crazy, crazy people. Then I talked about a study done on resistance training and volume. They compared three types of volume, low volume training, mo moderate volume training, and high volume training. Pump up the volume, Sal. And then they looked at the results to see who built the most muscle. You're going to have to listen to the episode to find out the results. Then there was another study I brought up on training to failure. Failure is when you lift a weight until you can't lift it anymore. Does that get you better results than mm. stopping before that? Again, listen to the episode to find out the results of that study. Then we talked about using a sauna to fight sickness. Uh, now, this is a very interesting one. Um, you know, Using a sauna temporarily increases your core temperature, simulating a fever, stimulating your immune system. Yes, there are studies that show that this actually may work. Simulating uh, and stimulating. Now, Adam likes to use Mind Pump Sauna. Uh, we have a sauna by, it's a Sanctuary Y Jacuzzi Infrared Sauna. It's made by Clearlight Infrared. It's phenomenal, um, and they are one of our sponsors. So if you want to get a sauna like the one we use here at Mind Pump and you want to get those benefits, here's what you do. Go to infraredsauna.com forward slash Mind Pump to look at those clear light infrared saunas. You get up to $600 off when you mention Mind Pump. So when you get on there, tell them, hey, I heard about this place through Mind Pump. Then we talked about low vitamin D levels during the winter. Um, a lot of people's vitamin D levels drop during the winter because of the less sunlight. It's and, depressing, Sal. So. And some some researchers think that that may be why we have a flu season to begin with. So supplementing with vitamin D may be beneficial for a lot of people. But here's the thing. If your vi vitamin D levels are already high, supplementing with vitamin D won't do you any benefit. In fact, may actually do you harm. So how do you know if you need to supplement with vitamin D to get your immune system to be stronger um, and that you, and so that you're not at a deficiency. You can test your vitamin D levels at home. Everly Well is an at-home test kit company that sends tests to your door, very inexpensive, no doctor's prescription required. And yes, we have a hookup for you. Go to everlywell.com. That's E-V-E-R-L-Y well, W-E-L-L, Dot com and use the code mind pump and get 15% off any tests on the whole site. Then I brought up the side effects of statins. These are cholesterol lowering drugs that have some mental side effects in people. Then we talked about how the box office raked in $11 billion. It's a massive year. Hmm. We talked about Pokemon Go and worldwide, how that's getting close to reaching a billion dollars. Apparently it still exists in sales. And then I brought up a video I saw on kids and how to help them deal with their feelings. That was a cool discussion. Then we got into answering the questions. The first question, this person's doing stomach vacuums for the first time, getting great results in a smaller midsection. And stomach vacuums, that's a forgotten exercise. It's bodybuilders used to do that back in the day. Nobody really does those doesn't anymore. Doesn't actually involve a vacuum. Doesn't, yeah, it doesn't involve vacuuming the house. But they're asking, look, are there any other exercises that people did way back in the day that we forgot about? that have amazing results. So we talk about some of our favorite forgotten exercises in that part of the episode. Next question, this person's a hard gainer. They've downloaded our hard gainer guide, um, but they're having trouble getting enough calories. Um, and they asked if if getting you know a weight gainer from a company like Legion, Legion's a company we work with, by the way, if that is gonna be valuable. So we talk about how to eat more food, uh, strategies to increase your appetite, workouts that help you build muscle. And if you do want to go the weight gainer route, uh, Legion is a, again, it's a great company and we have a discount. Go to buylegion.com forward slash mind pump. Use the code mind pump at checkout for 20% off your first order. Or if you're a current Legion consumer, you'll get double rewards points. The final, the next question was, uh, what is the minimum macro calorie intake that you would like to see somebody at before they start to cut. So when you're trying to get leaner, you have to reduce your calories. But we always recommend people get their calories up to a certain point. In other words, get your metabolism fast before you start to cut so you have room to go. So we give the numbers that we like to see people at before we start to do that. And the final question, this person can only work out in the morning and at the evening, but they have their best workouts in the midday. What kind of tips do we have for them to help them improve the productivity of their morning or late evening workouts. Also, this month, MAPS hit 
is 50% off. Now, HIT is an acronym. It stands for High Intensity Interval Training. HIT training uh, has been shown in studies to burn more body fat in shorter periods of time. In other words, a 20-minute HIT session can burn as much body fat as a 40 to 50-minute traditional cardio or workout session. So it's shorter time, great fat burning effect. The problem is most HIIT workouts are designed poorly. They dramatically increase risk of injury or they're just crappy workouts that don't produce great results. So we created MAPS HIIT. It's a full workout based around high intensity interval training. We included it with three levels, beginner, intermediate, and advanced. So it's suitable for a lot of different people. Um, and it's got everything in there. It's got your workout demos, your exercise demos, blueprints. So you don't have to do any of the work. You just go in there, follow the program at the gym or at home if you have dumbbells and a barbell uh, for excellent results. So that program's half off. Here's how you get the discount. Go to mapshit.com. That's M-A-P-S-H-I-I-T.com and use the code HIT50. That's H-I-I-T-5-0. No space for that discount. The billionaire who is, who's paid for the, the seat to go uh, there. Like, to Mars? No, no, no. Yeah, yeah. To Mars, I think it is. I just he, read. So he's, he's, already in, he's already like invested with i think it's elon like that if if and when we can do this i want a so he's a round trip or whatever there and he's he's, he's gonna do there's it. no round trip yeah, there's no coming back there's a there's a reality show that he's about to do about finding his his partner like he's gonna do like a bachelor bachelor because he's looking for a girl to take to Mars. Yeah, and he's a billionaire. Wow. Yeah, let me. I fucking read it this morning. I, that's a that's a okay. Yeah. You guys yeah. know what a self selection bias is, right? <laughs> so like study like they'll run a study. And Meet the women the, who are going to Mars. Thirteen new astronaut. Okay, yeah. let me show so you. so they'll run a study, but because of the study itself, it, automatically you get a bias of who will do the study. Yeah. Okay. So you're about to fly to Mars, which will probably take years, and you're not going to come back. No. What kind of group of women do you think would want to go with you yeah crazy yeah real psychotic <laughs> yeah i want to get off earth yeah. the, the kind that where I, depends diapers just to follow you i don't know the, the ones that want super fucking stardom right that want care about being famous because you're gonna be famous forever right you'll go down as the okay yeah. ja a japanese billionaire is looking for a space girlfriend yes you read that <laughs> space right girlfriend? you saka you saka mazwa the guy who's Wait, who, what's his name Yuzaka Mazwa. Okay. Yuzaka Mazwa. I thought Mazwa. I knew him. Sorry. I didn't yeah. The guy who's paying a pretty penny to pretty become SpaceX name. first. Spa oh, it's okay. So just space tourists. It just doesn't say it's going to Mars. That's so what I thought. Dude, yeah. you go to Mars, you're well, not coming but back. But still, listen, though. Right. Like, the guy who's paying a pretty penny to become SpaceX first space tourist announced that he's looking for a life partner to travel to space with him. It doesn't end there. He's also plans to find this lucky lady by hosting a bachelor style reality TV competition. Wow. Isn't that funny? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. How, dude, you know what's crazy to me is uh, how- It was a fashion mogul. Like, now, if the girl agrees, she's probably going to feel some pressure to at least- Put out? Give him a hand job or something, right? Because well, yeah. he just bought you millions of dollars you're of tickets. You're in the zero gravity club at that point, right? Yeah, you're- Oh, no. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> what's that? Yeah. <laughs> oh, oh. Hey. It's on my head. We got some, we got some floaters. I think, you know what? I've never heard anyone talk- Do they? Have, does, does it, do any of the astronauts, they got to have sex. They had to, right? I don't think they have sex, but they're they sure they, they jerk off. Does that off. ever happen? What? Like in the space like, Yeah, somebody had, somebody, had to have done it. Yeah, somebody had to be. Like, Do you know what the ratio? James Bond did. Yeah. Well, yeah Thanks, Doug. In, in Moonraker. He did. That's could you old... look? Google that. There's got to be somebody who, who had sex in space. Hold on a second. First though. person to have sex in space. But do you know yeah. what the ratio of female to male astronauts is out in space? It's it's terrible. Doesn't matter well, if you're the one female. I'm sure every every dude's trying. I mean, <laughs> you know? you're in space. You know, there's no rules. <laughs> space train. Yeah, that's terrible. Yeah, and uh, there could be, and no, there could, you, be it could be gay sex too. So right. it doesn't. I'm just, any true. any so sex. I mean, it's yeah, it, it's all free form at that point. If if it doesn't count, it yeah. is all the same. No, it doesn't count. If astronauts uh, have had very space difficult. Sex. Astronauts also have a demanding work schedule, leaving them with little energy or time to messing around. That's a stupid <laughs> argument. <laughs> That is stupid. That's a stupid argument. Did you see though? They are trying to like actually build a, a kind of a hotel like in, in space. Like they're, they're trying to work their way so it's like a tourist thing. They fly up there, they stay a night up there, you know, in space. Like it, I don't know if it's in the atmosphere or like you know just outside it or what. But they're they're already working on this Dude, space I would, hotel. I would yeah, that's I would cool. do that. But do you know that, that actually is really cool? You guys yeah, I would do that. Do you guys know it's dangerous to stay in zero gravity for too long? 
Did you guys read about that? What's uh, considered too long? Uh, uh, that's a like, good question. That's a good question. There was well for your body for sure, but psychologically, like w w what are the all damages? of it? All yeah. of it. It's not just your body psychologically too. Yeah. Because the, remember, the human body evolved with gravity, and so what they did is they actually did a test. If I'm not mistaken, there's Moonraker. Thanks, Doug. Yeah. Was that oh, when well, yeah, that movie came out when you were uh, <laughs> <laughs> 1960? <laughs> uh, Doug, who can you pull just, up? Just rake it. Pull up the, the 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 astronaut who lived in space too long, or something like that, or the whatever. Doug was too excited to look for that. I know. Yeah. He's like, I know, I've seen a few porn. <laughs> like, I remember yeah. this. Yeah. So there was this. They were spinning. I believe they were twins. I believe one of them stayed on Earth. The other one went into space and lived there for a full year, mm. and then he came back. This and, is a true story. You, are you talking about okay, a movie? Here it is. Scott Kelly. Now, I don't know if he had a twin. I don't know. Maybe I made that part up. But it was a one-year mission to see how low gravity effects. would affect the body. Oh. And uh, What did they find? Oh, dude. He had terrible issues, terrible health issues, anxieties, depressions, his bones weakened. He exercised and everything in space, too, to try and reverse some of that stuff. Yeah. Digestion was all fucked up when he came back. Because you know, a, oh, I'm sure it's yeah. a year. You're lying gravity a year, to push though, guy. Yeah, what mean, were the, what Justin was the, and I are talking about staying a weekend at the hotel. That's not we're not about yeah, staying no, there for. Yeah, you'll be all right. You'll bounce back. When was the last time you had more than a ten day vacation, dude? <laughs> you're, yeah, like, yeah. you're not going to space for a year, a whole year. Yeah, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I wonder what the side effects were. If you could find those, Doug, I'd love to see what some of those side effects were. But. Yeah, I just find it funny. People want so badly to go to Mars. You know, like it totally has to be that. Like I'm the Christopher Columbus. I'm like the undiscovered territory thing. But you're gonna die. Yeah, there's nothing there that's inviting. Yeah, and, and you're yeah, not but you know what though? That's a really good. That's a great analogy. I mean, uh, probably at that time when people were talking about doing that, there was probably fear around. Would there be food? Would we be able to survive? You mean Would for there... like Christopher Columbus? Yeah, I mean, don't, you don't think that? Oh yeah, they were the dude Lewis uh, Lewis and Clark. Yeah, who explored, uh, you, you know, North America? They didn't have a map. They had not. They didn't know what they were doing. Right. So they were. They was basically like going to Mars. Right. So it, it definitely had to have similar type of. Fears. Well, here's the difference, though. When you go up to Mars you can today, actually see food yeah. you know, and shoot it you know, with an arrow. Yeah, or you something. know, there's something to kill. Yeah, there's something. Well, you, like well nothing there. no. When you're traveling to somewhere where no one's ever been, they don't know that. It they could don't, be. Yeah. You're right. You're right. Yeah, but here's don't. the difference, though. When you're you're leaving. Spain in you know hundreds of years ago to go to New World. You're not leaving something awesome to go somewhere scary. You're kind of like this place sucks. I'm just gonna go see what happens. Yeah, you're leaving Earth now. A lot of people year think 2020. A lot of people think Earth sucks. Really? I think we're doomed. This is what the best. A lot of people Those think people we're are doomed. idiots. I, well, yeah. There's a there's a lot of people <laughs> yeah. that think we're doomed. Come on, how this, you, this you talked the, to, we've all talked to many people who believe that. Sure, but at the moment is the best place to live. At. Ever, yeah, ever, yeah, anywhere. Well, again, same thing they were saying about that. At the moment, that was Dude, the that one was, thing. Chris, like, if they still believed the world was flat, right, and then like you you reached the edge and you like fell off, like that might be kind of scary. Don't flat earthers say that that to pre the reason why that doesn't happen is because there's an ice wall. Yeah, there's an ice wall like in uh, Game of Thrones, apparently surrounding the world. Fucking, yeah, that's what they say. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> something crazy like that. <laughs> they yeah. said at the edges of the Earth are ice walls. Uh, yeah, massive that ice wall. nobody's seen. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, or that people have seen, but it's the it's the biggest. We're just a spinning pizza disc. Most know, elaborate the, yeah. conspiracy theory of all time. <laughs> like every pilot and like boat ship captain. Yeah, is in on it. You know what I mean? Yeah. When you get to the end, they're you're like, just oh. really going back and forth. Yeah, apparently. FBI calls you up like, hey, uh, you've reached the ice wall. Yeah. You're not going to tell anybody, okay? <laughs> Yeah, we we have uh we have some smart people here. We've screenshotted the porn pages you look at, so you're not going to tell anybody no. uh, that you could fall off the uh, the side of the earth. Wow. Well. Anyway, did I? Uh, oh, I, I got to tell you guys about a couple new studies that came out on resistance training. Oh yeah, new. All right, yeah. Like, like you know what I love about studies? Uh, some of these well made studies is that. Uh, well, you know what? I'm going to read you guys the study, and then I want to hear what you guys think the results are. Okay. These rats are people. No, these are people. This okay. is a resistance mm. training. Uh, these are exercise people. Um, what were the rats doing last time when we asked him? Playing. <laughs> <laughs> rats are playing with Yeah, now these rats are uh, lifting dumbbells? No, these are not. Yeah. This is a human study. So there's three groups. Okay. Okay. The three groups are following the exact same workout. So the exercises on one of the days, I'll give you one of the days as an example. Bench press, dumbbell fly, cable triceps extension, back squat. Leg extension. Okay, so that's one of the days. The next day would be lat pull down, dumbbell reverse fly, bicep curl, seated leg curl. So those are the two workouts. They're going to do them twice a week. 
So, you know, workout A, workout B, All rest. All three groups are. Yes. Rest, workout A, workout B. Okay. Okay. What are our variables? Now, here's the variables. Workout uh, Group one does four sets of every exercise. Group two does six sets of every exercise. Mm -hmm. Group mm. three does eight sets of every exercise. They they trained to they trained with a with a relatively high intensity, so apparently everything was good. Which group? Oh, interesting. Do you think had the most gains? Now let's count that for a second. Yeah, that's yeah, total, you got to pay attention. That's eight. That's you got sixteen. But remember, the body parts are only being worked twice a week. Twice a week with the, some exercises. Some exercises there's dual there's dual things. You had like didn't I hear uh, chest fly with bench press? Uh, yeah, a little bit, but okay. m mainly it's like one body part. Uh, twice a week, but you're yeah you're right. So uh, um, yeah, and if you have someone doing eight eight, that's sixteen potentially sixteen to thirty two sets on it. My guess without with just that information alone, I'm gonna guess the one in the middle. Um, mm. Close got the best results. Close. It was actually the most the higher volume, the highest volume. The, did. the highest volume. Now group. okay, in how short of a study too? Well, um, that's a good question. I should pull up how long that study was, but um, uh, it was it's 2018 study, which is pretty cool. And the, oh, I should say this: the groups were intermediately trained, so they were not beginners. Mm. So they did have some experience uh, lifting weights. Okay, but the higher volume, the higher volume group built muscle. And if you think about it, when you look at it on paper, Adam, it's not a ton of volume. If you really think about it, it's a decent amount of volume, but not a ton. But it was superior. The middle volume group did better than the lowest volume group. So volume definitely makes a big difference. Well, I've been making that case well, yeah. for some time on this podcast. I know, I, I know. That measuring that is like the, one of the single best things that somebody... And here's the thing that I find interesting about measuring volume is uh, just your behaviors, what ends up happening. If you don't track it and you've never tracked before, uh, and then you begin tracking, one of the, the things that you start to realize really quick is that you have these natural... Uh, ebb and flows where you're higher one week, lower the next week. And then, you know, over the course of one month or three months, uh, many people that are stuck in plateaus kind of average the same amount of volume uh, week to week, even though it may, they may have a high week for two weeks in a row and then like a moderate to low. But when you look at it as a, as a whole over the course of two or three months, you, you kind of find this homeostasis for volume and you just kind of hover around there. Yes, you change exercises, maybe you switch programming up, maybe you hire intense days these days, but overall, you kind of hover around the same. And the single best thing uh, when I was competing to, to like guarantee you know change and growth in my physique is was gradual, increased volume week over week over week and just a little bit yeah. mm -hmm. and and being very methodical about that i'm going to start off with the least amount of work to a list amount most amount of change mm -hmm. and then every week i'm going to make sure i give a little bit more volume now, now, now he, he said the intensity was pretty much uh shared in, in each group same. Like the same yeah, efforts uh, the, it, exerted it says they went to failure now here's the thing though uh studies when they go to failure it's basically when form breaks down uh, so they don't tip. They don't treat failure the same way people in gyms yeah. tend to treat failure. But you can you can rest assured it was an intense uh, intense workout. But yeah. you asked a great question, Adam. You asked how long the study was. Yes, I found it. How long? Eight weeks long. Okay, so mm -hmm. now it makes perfect sense. Okay, totally so that's does. That's a great. Of course window. it does. Yeah, <laughs> that hard, That so what I would if I had a year long study of this exact same thing, what I think would be would show the most amount of results is. Starting in the amount of volume that group one is at, yeah. then progressing to group two, yeah. Correct. graduating, then, then progressing to group three versus any of those staying at one for the entire, even mm -hmm. the highest volume. Because then if you look at the total volume for the year, group three would still have more volume over the course of the year. But I think that there would be, you would see more value and you'd see more gains if you progressively worked up to that over the course of a year, then jump right into it with that much Yeah, because the wall that they would hit... Yeah, because they're almost at the peak already. They're hitting 32 yeah. sets per body part per week. Um, an eight-week period, that's probably going to elicit decent gains. If, For sure. If, you're, if, you're, if you have some experience, a beginner is going to probably overtrain right away. But to somebody who's got some experience, great. But how hard do you think the wall is going to be that they hit <coughs> after... Five months, six months of doing thirty-two sets right. per body part. I mean, the wall is going to be as hard as the one that's around the earth that doesn't let us fall. Off the <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that thing's holding strong. Doesn't fall. Yeah. All right, so I have another. Yeah. I have another study uh, on training failure. So this is on lifting to failure, and this one involved uh, experienced lifters. So these were lifters who had a decent amount of experience. It was around, on average, eight years of experience lifting three times a week. So they're big dudes. 
who've been working out for a little while. Now, they both did workouts. The only difference between the two was one group took their every single set to real yes. failure, and the other group stopped just short of failure. Who do you think uh, got the best progress? Over what's the how length? What's the length of study? Ooh, I'm going to find the study for you because yeah. I got I got to find that. Well, you're going to run into the exact same problem again yeah. if it's in a, a a short eight week or less window. The people that went to failure every single time are going to probably see the most results. But if we stretch that over the course of months, you know, three months, six months, uh, and beyond, yeah, uh, I would I would just I would speculate the group that came short to failure. Yeah. Now I can't find. I'm trying to look how long it was, but typically these studies are done for eight to you know for for two to three months type of deal. So I'm going to assume that's what it was. Um, but uh, yeah, going to failure resulted in less gains. Oh, less, less even. It did. Wow, even in a short period. Well, dude, that's interesting. I mean, going consider this: going to failure sometimes, and and even even bodybuilders like Dorian Yates mm. talked about this. Going to hard failure sometimes is more intense for people who know how to work out oftentimes than for beginners because when when you're experienced, you can push your body. Right. Yeah. And you're going to failure in every single set. Um, that's just another study to study the support, what we talk about, which is going to failure is just, it's too much intensity most of the time for most people, yeah. even if you're experienced. Sometimes you're pushing outside your ability. Totally. Yeah. Absolutely. Totally. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Anyway, I saw you in the in the in the sauna uh, yesterday, Adam. Was it to get your cold? Yeah, to I go mean, away? yeah, no, I mean, I I haven't I haven't worked out now for over two weeks. <clears throat> I have intentions of either today or tomorrow being the day one. I've been kind of waiting until I completely recover. I was actually doing uh, I had a bunch of calls that I had to make with partners and stuff like that. <laughs> I was doing. You doing all your calls in the sauna? Yeah, now. well, because the infrared, you know, this one, like you can it won't melt your phone. Yeah, no, it's so you could <laughs> I could I could totally multitask and do that. And I know, obviously, uh, ideally, I'm in there doing like meditation and relaxing and stretching. But uh, honestly, I was I was going in there more because I wasn't feeling good and kind of sweating it out. Dude, I always feel way better afterwards. So mm. I used to I, I feel so bad now because I used to. Uh, I used to point people in the wrong direction. I would get, when I would manage gyms, I would have members come in and ask me about the sauna. And they would say things like, oh, you know, when I'm sick, I can come in here and just kind of sweat it out. I've always heard that, right? And I'd be like, no, it doesn't do that. It doesn't help you get better faster. That's a myth or whatever. Uh, it just feels good. Or I used to push people away from it. Well, it turns out I, I was totally wrong. Um, and it, it really, it goes back to how your body reacts when it has an infection. What happens when you're sick and you have an infection? You get yeah, a fever. Your core temperature uh, rises. You get a fever. And this is common among a lot of animals. Even cold-blooded animals, when they get ill, they move to warmer places to warm their bodies up. Mm. And scientists now know why that happens. Now, first off, your body temperature going up slows down the replication of the virus or bacteria. So it actually kind of prevents the bacteria and virus from replicating quickly. But it does other things. It actually activates immune cells and creates conditions that are more favorable for immune cells to travel through blood vessels and do what they're supposed to do. Mm. So they've done studies on animals where they don't even give them an infection. They just raise their, their, their body temperature and then they'll monitor these immune cells and they'll find that the immune cells go up. Mm. So just the heat alone boosts your immune system stimulates or, your defense system right it's like a it's like a uh, it's like a fake fever yeah if you will and this may be why uh you know i brought those other studies up before where they there were these are really well-made studies where they show that people who use saunas regularly have significantly less colds and flus uh you know because they they, they raise their body well, temperature up. i know this is only anecdotal but I literally in the last probably, I don't know, I'd say three months or so, um, I've been the most inconsistent with my uh, sauna use and uh, like my hot cold contrast, which I was doing really, really consistently for a while there, uh, and my vitamin D supplementation. Those two things uh, I got, I ran into my vitamin D a little while ago and I just I'm fucking busy and got around to ordering it. I keep forgetting, forgetting, whatever. And then I just haven't hadn't been using the sauna as much as I was using it a while ago, and sure as shit, I got fucking sicker than a dog. Mm -hmm. And I hadn't been sick in forever. It's been so long since I've been knocked down, especially knocked down as bad as I got knocked down right now. Dude, you mentioned vitamin D. 
Um, some researchers think that that's the reason why there's a flu season to begin with. Because mm. you wonder, like, because of the deficiency. Yeah, like, because it's kind of weird, right? Why? And, and in the past, they would say things like, "Oh, we're closer together. Hmm. We're indoors. We're you know, so we're spreading disease more, or whatever." <clears throat> But um, that you know that evidence is a, is a little weak. There is uh, some researchers that believe that it's because of the lack of sun exposure, mm-hmm. our already kind of low vitamin D levels because we tend to be indoors no matter what get even lower. And if you think about it, the peak of the flu season is like February. If I'm not mistaken, maybe Doug, you can look that up. I think is. Like right around February. Yeah, it's always in the winter for sure. It is. And so it's almost like you've had a couple months of less and less sunlight. Yeah. And then vitamin D levels go down, down, down. Now you're prime. Leaves you more susceptible. Well, especially somebody, I mean, when I tested my vitamin D levels, I was low and that was like in the summertime. Yeah. So I was already somebody, what was it say? Yeah, February. February is one of the highest months for the flu. If you look at that graph right there, mm. it kicks off in, in December and look at February. Uh, it's crazy. And it makes sense because you're you're in in many places of the US, for example, October, November, December, and January are all kind of darker mm-hmm. months. So you're not getting a lot of sunlight. Vitamin D levels are dropping. By the time you hit a deficiency, it's probably January, February, boom, the flu. So my advice, if you haven't been sick right now, is to be doing your hot, cold contrast training. So yeah. sauna, cold plunges, and then test and see if you have low vitamin D levels. And then start to supplement potentially if you have lower levels. You know what the problem with with testing for vitamin D is? You got you go to the doctor. You ask your doctor for a prescription for a test, and they're going to say use why. Every, use the Everlywell test. Oh, right. that's, mm-hmm. Yeah, that's right. simple. That's right. They do vitamin D yes, testing. Yes. No. Home. That's. I mean, that's where I. That I mean, you mentioned that for my psoriasis way back when, before, even before we were working with Everlywell. Uh, but I mean, that confirmed it, man. Once I, when I took that test and I was, I was already supplementing with 5,000 IUs already and still tested low. So that, for me, how long were you supplementing for when you took that, that uh, test? That's a good question because it was a while ago now. It was when we first started working with everyone. We've been with them now for over a year. Um, so I, I, I can't, I can't remember, Sal. I know it was at least a few weeks that I had already been supplementing for them. Uh, with it. Uh, it takes a while to build up vitamin D levels. Right, right, right. So I, I, I know it had been a little while. I don't know how long, to be honest with you, though. But I mean, just the simple fact that I was taking it, and I know I'd been taking it for a little while at least, and I was still testing low, mm-hmm. I was blown away by that. Well, I take, and, and uh, real cl- I want to be clear here, um, this can depend uh, on the individual. So what I do may not work for you, and it may actually raise your vitamin D levels too high. Having levels of D that are too high are not good for you either. You want to. Be, that's why you want to test. Yeah, that's why you want to test because if you're already super high, supplementing is going to make you not healthy. Um, but I was supplementing with 5,000 IU's between four to 5,000 IU's a day for a long time. I mean, years. I've been taking cod liver oil forever, which mm-hmm. that already has at least between one to 2,000 IU's in the dose that I take. Yeah. Then I'll supplement with an additional two or 3,000 in capsule form, at least for a year, the cod liver oil longer than that, probably four or five years. So I've been supplementing with vitamin D for a long time. I got tested. I did the Everly Well test and I was in the perfect amount. So what does that tell you? Yeah, That tells you that I needed yeah. to supplement that whole time because of the lack of sun exposure right. uh, that I get. So right. now along those lines of, uh, of medicine and all that stuff, um, do you guys know the connection? You guys know statins are, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Statins are um, drugs that you know, they prescribe to people to, to lower the cholesterol. It's the lower cholesterol. I thought statin was blood pressure too. No, blood pressures oh. are like, uh, I think, like calcium channel blockers and stuff like that. But Is that uh, right? Beta blockers. Beta stuff, blockers yeah. are to regulate heart rate, oh. uh, maybe even calcium channel. But anyway, statins uh, prevent the liver from producing uh, as much cholesterol as it normally would. And so it lowers your uh, cholesterol levels. And it does so reliably and very effectively. They're some of the most popular prescribed drugs. Um, they keep lowering the the, uh, uh, the the threshold for when you need to get prescribed statins, uh, in my opinion, probably to increase the amount of consumers that they can pre- prescribe them to. But anyways, did you guys know the connection between statins and mental health issues like depression and even, in some cases, changes in personality? No. Mm. Yes. there's a And that's actually one of the well-known 
uh, side effects of taking statins, yeah. which I I I, I kind of knew, but I didn't know that it was established. I thought maybe it was Isn't like- Isn't that most depression uh, medications they're finding? It's like it totally changes your behavior on some level? They Yeah, but they're totally different. So de- antidepressants, the most popular types of antidepressants work with serotonin in the brain. And what they do is they increase circulating levels of serotonin in the brain through preventing its or or reducing the reuptake of it, right? Um, Which makes sense because then what happens, your body gets adapted to you taking something exogenous and then you, then you no longer are probably producing it at normal natural levels anymore. So I, I would assume that if you're not on it, that's where the depression comes from. Or or I think uh, we I think it is you know it may help with depression, but we don't completely know the effects that increasing levels of serotonin in the brain will have on the body. And could that change your personality? Well, yeah, changing, you know, that's what we're trying to do with depression. We're trying to lift right. depression. But, but anyway, statins uh, have been shown to reduce cognitive ability and there's a depression risk with statins because cholesterol is so healthy mm. for the brain. It's mm-hmm. essential for brain. In fact, your brain tissue is the most cholesterol, one of the most cholesterol dense parts of your body. If you take your brain out and, and you analyze how much cholesterol is like packed, Full of cholesterol, Part so of the building block of the cell, right? Yeah, dude. So, so you got all these people on statins, and so uh, you know what I would like to look up, and I'm going to try doing this a little later. Is I'd like to look up the percentage of people who are on statins who are then later prescribed antidepressants, hmm. because uh, I bet you that number is. I wonder if that number is alarming. Wow. How many people take like statins they first go on a statin? Take depression. Yeah. So like, because wow. statins are typically pre- are, are typically prescribed to people over like 45, 50. Mm-hmm. So and in in that group over fifty are is the higher they have the highest rate of antidepressants. That's a well, hard nobody's thing. motivated to test that, right? Because that's a whole industry where they can find numbers that give you you know uh, the solution to that, which is in this pill form, which will lower that you know cholesterol number substantially, but the side effect may be depression. Yeah. So here's a pill for that. Yeah. You know uh, what I'm so saying? Now we'll give you this. You guys, you guys are trained people in advanced age. Um, do, do you guys ever get a list of their medication? You're asking. <laughs> oh you have my to, god. Yeah. Dude, yeah. it's it's substantial. Do you remember like, the first time? Did like that twenty shock pills? You? Yeah, like uh, multiple times a day. Yeah, I remember the first time that well, happened. The right? irony is that you end up you have one or two things going on with you, and you have to take a prescription or two for that. But because of that, you end up having to take three other prescriptions to counter the side effects of what those are taking. That's Dude, how they get to that like twenty pills. I'll, yeah. I will never forget. It, I, there was a woman that I trained. She was eighty two years old, and this is when I started to really figure out that I enjoy training this group of people. So she comes in, wonderful lady, and as part of my you know gathering information, I ask her for medications. Not because I'm a doctor, but just because I want to look and see if there's anything that contraindicates you know, certain types of exercise, things I need to work look out for. Plus I would contact the doctor, let them know that I'm training this woman. Is there anything I need to know or whatever? So she brings in this list of medications and it was three pages long. It was a printed, she printed it out on her computer and there were drugs that didn't seem to make sense. So I said, oh, this is, why do you take this laxative? And she's like, oh, that, I take that one because this other drug makes me constipated. constipated. Yeah. yeah. Why do you take this anti-anxiety medication. Well, because this other drug tends to make me feel anxious. Uh, anxious. <laughs> yeah. You know, why do you take these sleeping pills? Well, ever since I started to th- taking this other drug, I've had trouble sleeping. And I couldn't believe how many of the drugs were there to counter the other half of the drugs. You just become a chemistry experiment. It was insane, the yeah. amount of medications that they were on. It was it was just crazy. And that, that age group, uh, every time I trained somebody over the age of 65, they'd bring me a list of their medication. It was always at least one, yeah. usually three or more. Yeah. That was the, the more more often than not. No, we had to bring something up that, uh, you know, anytime that we're wrong, I, you know, we we, I, we always shed light on it, right? And it's not often. Were we wrong or yeah, were you it's wrong? It's not often. It's, uh, <laughs> well, it's actually, known to happen yeah, occasionally. No, I, I think we- oh, I was think, I wrong? You know, I think- you know, Oh, yeah. no, you're looking yeah, at me. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> what did I do? I Give definitely- head, yeah, head no, I'm pretty sure that we were all- Could have been me. I think we were all in agreement on this. And and uh, that was in, you know, we were taught, we always talk a lot about streaming services. We talk about Netflix and Disney Plus and all that shit. And yeah. Yeah, one our, of this, our, yeah, our expertise, right? Well, yeah, right. yeah absolutely. <laughs> no. This is this is why we're wrong, right? This yeah. is not our expertise. Yeah. Like we, <laughs> just, we do much we better. Just throw fucking spaghetti. Much on Much better at predicting yeah. shit in the fitness space, right? So we should stay in our lane. But <laughs> yeah. you know, we like to have fun and speculate on other yeah, other. That's in, no fun. Yeah, other industries, and one of the things speculate. that we we speculated on was uh, like the box offices, like movie theaters. 
And I was reading actually uh, an article this morning that said that this is uh, the fifth year in a row of, of them doing $11 billion in box office in just the U.S. Worldwide. So they're doing better than we thought. It, well, they're, what they are is they're maintaining, right? Uh, so they're not yeah. losing. I think we, we predicted that- Well, I'm was, glad we're wrong on that. It's only a matter of time that they would be closing down. And we were talking about all the ways they were pivoting by showing football and MMA fights now and there. And now everybody has the luxury seats and they're serving yeah. food. So, you know, it's uh, it's not dying. It's maintaining. So it's it's interesting to me that it's still producing that kind of revenue. I think... That's great. Well, look at the movies that they're producing that are making all the money. They're all superhero films and fantasy type films. Yeah. It's the, funny because a lot of the uh, Hollywood like directors out there talk a lot of shit about that. They're like, oh, it's just... None of it is art anymore. It's all like theme park uh, movies. Yeah. You know, and it's like, yeah... Okay, you know, you yeah. could you could make that argument for sure, but people fucking love it. You know, it's like it uh, again, like th- this is one of those things it's like give give people what they really want or challenge them. And well, we have we haven't seen a lot of movies out there that challenge people. Well before any streaming came along or anything like that, but were, was I mean I used to, I don't know if you guys are the same way. There were movies that like I used to say I must see it in theater and there were other movies I didn't care about and the ones that were must see were the action crazy yeah. what loud you know explosive action type movies I had to see mm-hmm. in, inside theater the others I always said oh wait now, till it comes you know out what on I DVD would, you know what I would like to see yeah. I would like to see how many tickets that is because the price of movies keeps going up so what if the revenue is big and flat because they're not selling more tickets they're just selling mm. more expensive tickets oh yeah i mean there's i mean that's but i mean that's just that smart bi- business pivot right sure. it's like you okay we we're, we're going to we're going to get less traffic that's a fact there's more people staying home and streaming but how do we not die as an industry okay let's find clever ways to increase the dollar amount per person by mm-hmm. including packages and higher pr- uh, price point because we are offering different services and that's yeah. exactly what they've done at the end of the day i mean that's what makes a very uh, good industry is that they they have found a way to handle this new onslaught of a generation of people that don't go to movies because they'd rather stream at home and stay in Netflix and chill, and they still have managed to maintain. Now you know yeah, what? it may be novel too right now the streaming because it's so convenient and everything's at your house, but it's a totally different experience when you go to the theater. Right, everybody's there laughing. Like you kind of react based off of everybody else's feeling. It's like this group feeling, you know. As you're watching what's in front of you, so a lot of people still really enjoy that. I, I also, you know, very good point, and it's a like a date, an event, right? Like nobody's like, you know, something to do. Yeah, it's there. <laughs> it is. It's something. It is. And I, I, and maybe it's because uh, having a son right now and and watching so much tele, I've watched more television in the last six months than I have probably in the previous, you know, twenty years, maybe. And uh, I feel disgusting sometimes after a while. <laughs> you ever, no, I really you just do. Never left your no, house. No, I, I really yeah. do. Like, like it's a, a problem. A, a series like gets me right. It sucks me in, and then I binge it. You know, where and I and then I look at the clock, and I'm like, holy shit! Like I I've watched just sat here all day. Yeah, the whole five day. hours. Like five hours glued to like the same fucking show, and I feel dirty. Yeah, yeah. I feel yeah. dirty afterwards. Like a, I do. Like you, no one's ever. Am I alone on this or what? Yeah, I'm the I'm still only my jammies. Yeah. And so I think there's. I, I think that's. I can't be the only person who feels that way when they get sucked you're in. Like, I almost, watched, you're like I've watched five hours of TV. I feel gross. Let's go to the movies and watch TV. There. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go do some productive. Well, I mean, what I, what I think we may see, and this was to Justin's point that it's you know the streaming thing at home is still novel, right? It's still mm-hmm. novel. It's competitive more and more. But eventually, and you you see this with some streaming services are going back to the old model of releasing one episode per week versus the here's yeah. the whole season to prevent the shame. Yeah, no, <laughs> yeah. I'm right. Just I mean, drip you, you your drug. Yeah, I can't. I can't be exactly. the only. Yeah. yeah, no, I really do think that, man. You know what? I remember that. I don't know if this still happens, uh, but part of me thinks it doesn't happen as much anymore because it's different, or part of me thinks. It, I just don't know what happens because I don't go to opening days for movies anymore. Mm. But I remember when I was a kid, when certain movies would come out, like Batman. Remember the, when Batman came out, the first one with uh, my, was it Michael, Michael Keaton? Keaton yeah. I remember the line being like out the theater. Oh, around it's still it's so the crazy. Does like it still that. do that? Oh yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. yeah. Depends okay. on the movie. Yeah, 
Yeah. I remember that. Like Jurassic Park was like that, where we were just around the block and we had to wait forever. I mean, I think almost every well, time a Star Wars yeah, comes out, it sells say, out. This is the first time. So last year and the year before that, like for the newer like relaunch of it, uh, like I went a little bit later because I was like, I don't want to go when it, when everybody's like, you know, it's super crowded, crazy, whatever. And so, like this year, I was like, "No, I'm gonna do it like right, at, like the the screening before it's even launched." You know, and like I want to get there like with all like the super fans, and it was so much better. Was it really? It was so much better, dude. Everybody really fucking wanted to be there. They're not going there just like, oh, well, I don't know if this is gonna be any good. <laughs> you know, like that kind of bullshit energy. You know, yeah. it's like you know, I'm wearing my robe. I got my lightsaber. <laughs> you know, like there, there's, there's people with like Princess Leia buns. You know, they're, they're cheering. They're throwing fucking popcorn. You know, it's, it's a totally different experience. Dude, I went. We went to go watch uh, Boss Lady. I think it was called. Uh, don't watch it. T- T- boss lady T- terrible terrible is that movie. recent yes dude is it a cartoon or no is it- it's a movie i don't know if it's called boss lady or the big boss with salma hayek plays this 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 like ceo of this makeup company it's supposed Man, to be get, a comedy you get roped into watching some interesting you know what movies. you know why though yeah what? because i like i'll go to any movie <laughs> yeah. i love the movies i love sitting in a theater yeah. and in in chilling or whatever yeah. like listening to enya when you work yeah. out yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> the, the notebook yeah. so it's right around the corner. Hey, along the lines of more things we were wrong at right everything i was reading this uh this morning i swear I was like fuck we were wrong there again uh we talked maybe like six months ago about uh pokemon go and how it just like it was a one hit wonder, it exploded, right. and then we never heard about it again. Uh, wrong. Uh, it made eight hundred ninety four million dollars in two thousand nineteen, <laughs> which was more than their launch. What? So it's bigger. It was bigger. Is in that because of worldwide sales? I guess it has to be. You know, and all the problem. I'm sure you have all the stuff that they made off of it. Like I'm yeah. sure there's coloring books and toys and all kinds of other bullshit around it. So. Uh, but man, eight hundred ninety-four million dollars in two thousand nineteen. Uh, yeah, it's still it's That's still so a cra- viable business. That's crazy. <laughs> yeah, it just like came and went. Like I, I've for a while there, you almost saw kids out there everywhere with their phone, just like kind of scanning areas. I remember it became a problem because like people were. Walking, We're into, walking into different like parts of like private land where they weren't supposed to be, and people were you know like getting in trouble because they're trespassing. No, it'd and all be, stuff. it would be really interesting to see. I don't know where it's got to be worldwide sales. That's yeah, what I think. Yeah, worldwide. I think Chinese kids started doing it. <laughs> Seriously, I, I thought they were first. Didn't weren't they first? And we were, were second. They? I thought so. I don't remember to be honest. Maybe well, Japanese. But I, I mean, I but here's the thing. I, I mean, I'm sure. Uh, Continued app sales and people, you know, whenever we saw, it, I guarantee we weren't the last country to get on yeah. board. So I'm sure it got other countries adopted later on, and that probably drove a lot. And then what all of these things do, yeah, like surprising, it becomes a big, you know, like a, a good example of this is, um, you guys remember, you I know, well maybe you guys don't because you guys don't have young enough kids anymore, but you know the shark to do to do, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. baby shark, yeah, yeah baby shark or whatever. I mean, yeah. that are would you, are you showing your son that? He hasn't seen it. Oh no, he has seen it. I think. Uh, I like his yeah, do 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 do. Yeah, <laughs> shark did do do do. Don't do it. Don't yeah, do yeah, it. Yeah, don't yeah, do it. Bro, but that we'll it, lose every listener. Every listener. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> what a phenomenon you. that becomes, right? It, it blows up first on something like YouTube, and I think it, I think it's like one of the few videos. I think that's even in the like hun- either hundreds of millions or billion views. Uh, it's crazy yeah. on how many views. But from that, I mean, they have now. If you go to like Target or you know any of the toy stores, you've got they have a whole line of products a- around. That and now there's all these different sequels to it. It's it's they're insane. They're selling doo doo yeah. shark. Oh look, there's the Pokemon. Oh there you go. Yeah. By the way, that doo-doo movie sharks. that movie was called Like a Boss that you should not watch. Uh, so oh, there you go. Okay. Good. So what does that no say problem. there, Doug? It looks like uh, Asia yeah. Asia Pacific. Yeah, oh, Asia well. Pacific is definitely the biggest user yeah. of Pokemon. Now world. does that include so Asia Pacific? That is that includes, shocking? Does that include so that's Japan? Does that include China? No. Oh. Inter- I, I would say so. Interesting how it continued to dramatically climb. So huh? the US, it looked like it flattened out a little bit or grew a little bit, but not big. Still, but still no. growing. Bro, US went from, from first year, launched 27 to 67. It's oh, still 3X. Yeah, but I'm looking at the like previous year, went from 60 to 67. So not a, But look at Asia Pacific. Yeah. It, it that went, went last it went year. Gangbusters. 240 was at 5, 240 to 300. I mean, that's, look at that okay. growth. Right and there. is this just the, the app, Doug, that you're looking at? Yes. Right. So, I mean, who knows what yeah. they did revenue on other other revenue streams, That's too. number of active users of Pokemon Go worldwide. So, combined, that looks like you're looking at over half a billion 
people playing Dude, one here's game. another viral thing I just don't understand. So I know, like, I don't know if it's in Japan, Korea, or China, like... There's this 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 whole like uh, you know proper way to eat like it's 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 not like uh, I've talked about this. You this can is talk it. about where they just get really super messy and just like eat, slap their face with eat weird huge bowls of food and they smack their lips and there's, a, there's but they're like eating normal and then all of a sudden they're like, blah, 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 and just like slapping all over what? their face. There's a name for it. There's a name. Yeah. What's it called? Do you know what it's called? You bring no, it up I, and you don't know the name of yeah, it. I don't Shame know. on you. I, <laughs> like I you've never done that. I, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> fucking hypocrite. Only one of us actually yeah. <laughs> has a <laughs> nose to read. <laughs> yeah, no, we I, need somebody to know it. I like. did. I talked. It's like some of the most viral YouTube videos uh, are these videos. And yeah. it's, uh, it sucked me in. That's one. just mind blowing to me. Uh, uh, Where they just eat loud and it records the sounds of their. Yeah, they slurp it in and it's just like all of the face so there's a there's an actual phobia against mouth noises forgot the name of it but uh jessica has it to a small degree which i feel bad for because she's with this guy yeah no you know I'm, i mean the, I, i'm the <laughs> same way too like i get uh, it's it's hard for me when someone's yeah, yeah. smacking their lips like crazy dude yeah. i was uh i was watching this video on raising kids and i thought this was a really fascinating thing to kind of bring up and it, first it shows this little kid who's freaking out um, because I forgot, they think they didn't have their blanket or something. And so mom and dad are just there, just there letting the kid freak out, hugging them when they want to hug, kind of making sure that they don't hurt themselves as they lose their temper or whatever. And you're watching this video, and after about a few minutes, I think it was like three minutes of this kid screaming, the kid puts their thumb in their mouth, walks over to dad and gives them a hug. And so then the video talks about how to handle your kids and their strong feelings. And they said one of the worst things you could do to a kid is make them feel bad for having their feelings or not feeling accepted. So like your kid gets real angry and you're like, hey, you can't get angry in this house, go in your room or don't cry, whatever. They said that that actually doesn't help a kid evolve the way that they, uh, they, they, they feel things. They said what you should do is allow your kid to feel and acknowledge it. I can see that you're sad right now. Of course, don't let them hurt themselves or others. Let them feel it and then discuss with them when they're done. Mm. And I've tried this now with my daughter a couple times. Now, my daughter's older. She's 10. Uh, but she'll get really angry about certain things. And I've tried this a couple times. And it's the most, it's like a hack. It's like <laughs> an incredible hack. Yeah. Like, she, I forgot what she got so mad at, but she'll get mad. Well, if, like, instead she of trying to fix it or, like, doing something. Or fix their feelings, right? Right, right. So I don't remember what it was. She, 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 I think with her socks didn't match or something like that. And she got all like, <laughs> oh. You know, losing her temper, and I'm like, "Wow, it looks like you're really upset." I can see that. Yeah, my son. I said, "Okay." I said, "Listen, you let me know when you feel better, and let me know what you'd like me to do." And so she did. She lost her temper, got really pissed off. Then she finally she got calm, and she came to me, and she's like, "I'll, I'll just wear these other socks." Now, had I told her, "You're gonna wear these other socks, you're gonna stop freaking out," yeah. it would have lasted, you know, thirty minutes. Now, I wonder if that works mm. uh, similar to like what I do right now. I mean, Katrina hates this. Uh, when I do this, um, but I don't know. I just I feel like uh, I don't want to one uh, raise my emotions. Two, I also don't want to allow him to train me uh, by things by screaming or crying. So, you know, every once in a while, like it, right now, Max is teething, right? So he he will throw like he he'll just at nighttime. Sometimes he'll just all of a sudden throw this crazy tantrum and he's kicking and screaming, and you could tell he's just he hurting. He doesn't want to go to bed. All the above, whatever. And normally it's pretty easy. One, Katrina and I rarely ever have to go up to put him back down to bed. Uh, we let him cry for the tip, what they call the 10 minute method. He cries for 10 minutes and then we go in there and we uh, console him and then put him back to sleep. And he normally goes down unless like he's having one of these fits and he had one of these the other night. Um, and, you know, she, we have the monitor so you can hear and see everything. So she's, you know, even though I go up there, I know she can't stop but stare and watch and listen to everything. Right. So. I'll go up there sometimes and if I and first thing I'll try to console him and if I notice he's just pissed and throwing a fit instead of like trying or getting frustrated I'll actually just lay down on the bed next to him and just let him fucking cry yeah and mm -hmm. just scream and cry I'm holding I'm, but he knows you're there yeah, yeah. I'm, and I'll, I'll be rubbing his chest hey and every once in a while I'll say it's okay buddy and I just and he's crying and she'll he's come in she's like out. what are yeah. you doing yeah. what are you doing why aren't you I'm like, let him have his feelings he's fine I'm right here I'm not leaving him I'm not yelling at I'm not doing anything I'm just allowing him to get it all out and and just know that I'm right here. Mm -hmm. I'm not, a, and most importantly, what I think that and you make sure it's not diaper, it's not. Yeah, 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 yeah. right, right. I know it's all not none of those things, right? And, and what I think happens a lot to, to parents is because I can trust me inside, I feel it. 
uh, you get frustrated and you want to escalate, right? Mm -hmm. You want to be upset now that they're upset and then it turns into th just no good. So it's really me keeping my myself calm and like, hey, he this is his only way of communicating right now. He's trying to express whatever. Uh, but I also don't want him to think that every time he throws a tantrum, I come to his beck and call and then do whatever he wants. Uh, but then I'm also there for him. So I don't know. This is an area where her and I kind of go back and forth on how we do things. And Interesting. I do that. And she, Well, the fact that you're there is different than leaving him and letting him cry. Right. Totally mm -hmm. different. And I, that's what this video showed. It was like this little kid was losing his shit. And the dad, and every once in a while, the little kid would like, you know, try to bang his head on the wall or whatever. And the dad kind of puts his hand uh -huh. there to stop him, or he wants to throw something. He grabs it. No, don't throw that. And just lets the kid feel it. And then mm -hmm. you could see the kid afterwards kind of process it. And like I said, I've done it a couple times. I'm, again, my my daughter's older, but it makes perfect sense. Adults are like that too, though. Yeah, I think the fear is that you know that pattern of behavior is going to continue, which. You know, you don't realize they're kids. They're, they're, they're. All this stuff is new. They're like, all these out. feelings are brand new. And, and you know, like we, we project our own. Like, well, I would never, you know, scream or cry or like uh, we do that a lot. I even catch myself with that. You know, every now and then, like, why did he react like that? That's just like that's crazy. Like, but they're still figuring out how to cope and how to, you know, properly conduct themselves, uh, you know, in situations. And so, yeah, it's definitely. Uh, you, something you kind of have to pull your own self out of it, let them work through it. And then, you know, <laughs> hopefully like they build that uh, knowledge themselves. Mm -hmm. All right. Our first question is from Stephen Baldwin. I started doing the real date Stephen Baldwin. Uh, wow. Well, he is a real Stephen Bald Baldwin, but I don't think he's the actor. <laughs> uh, mm. I started doing daily stomach vacuums for the first time about a month ago and have seen significant results in a short period of time. My question is, what other unique or forgotten exercises should I be doing that will have similar benefits and results? You know, you, it's, I'm glad I somebody- I Alec Baldwin, actually. Yeah, better. I'm glad yeah, you, that's it, just me. you guys, you posted this question because there's an exercise that I think is going to become forgotten pretty soon. We've put it in quite a few of our programs because we all value it, but I, I just don't see people doing it almost ever. It definitely wasn't being done when I was managing gyms. And even now when I go and uh, I work in gyms or, or work out in gyms, I should say, I don't see people doing this exercise almost ever. And that's a pullover, a, just a dumbbell or barbell pullover. I almost feel like this exercise is going to become – and you know why I think it's going to become forgotten? Because it doesn't necessarily target a specific – it works so many different muscles. Hmm. It's not like an isolation movement for too many other things or for too many things. That I think that's why it's falling out of, out of favor. I, 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 like, I love it. I like that. I like that uh, point, and I, I think that's a good thing to talk about. And the reason why I think it <clears throat> is because it's an area where uh, if you if you are somebody who is young now and you have no problem reaching above your head and picking things out of the out of the you know cupboard or whatever like that, uh, that's great. But it becomes an area that's very common when you train people in advanced age that mm -hmm. can't do that. And I would. Uh, speculate that if you did a good job of continuing to do pullovers for most of your life, this would be an area that you would stay very connected to and probably wouldn't lose that ability. So I like that one. Yeah, and uh, it gives you good, sh it's good shoulder mobility. Right. It works the lats. It works the pecs. Um, it works the serratus muscles, which are the finger-like muscles in the side of the rib cage. I fell in love with pullovers well, I first started doing them because uh, when I started working out, they were a big, you know, Arnold Schwarzenegger liked to do them. And then because Mike Menser did them in his heavy duty workouts and I became a fan of his. But now I've always done them since because I've always gotten great results from them, mm -hmm. either in my chest workout or my back workout. I've just always felt great results from them. And I think it, and it makes my torso feel more integrated together mm -hmm. and strong, um, especially the barbell version. I almost, I never see anybody do. Barbell pullovers. Yeah, I don't know. It, I mean, it's tough to think. Like, like uh, I was thinking about like maybe a windmill as being an example, just because oh, yeah. it's it it is like a forgotten exercise that is kind of 
you know, it's coming back on some level, but it's like only people that are really into kettlebells or into unconventional training in general, which I feel like the general public could benefit from this exercise more than anybody. Uh, in, in the simple fact that, um, you know, just, just being able to stabilize, you know, your spine in rotation and then also like the hip hinging aspect to it, um, you know, holding something overhead. And so, uh, you know, the, the unilateral, you know, like, part of that in, in terms of stabilizing the, uh, you, you know, the QL, like mm -hmm. all these types of things that are involved in, in this particular exercise, like you really have to, um, you know, take your time with it and, and be able to, uh, embrace your body and be able to have control over, you know, your T spine and all these different things. So I think that it, it also, uh, it, it, it helps to, uh, it helps to benefit uh, the way that we're sitting all the time and, and, and the way that we're always protracted and that, you know, it, it's sort of like uh, it helps to, to embolden, uh, you know, your spine and the function of it uh, and protect it better. Yeah, I, the, I, I agree. The windmills are great exercise. And really, if you want to find some of the best exercises that people don't do anymore, go back to look at the lifting the, the exercises that were popular in the in the 30s and 40s and maybe even the 20s among strong men and bodybuilders mm -hmm. and what you'll find so i said the pullover right mm -hmm. in those days a pullover was was one of the main exercises in fact it was one of the most popular exercises not only was it not forgotten but it was like the bench press like everybody did some kind of a pullover everybody did a windmill, mm -hmm. and the reason why they did a windmill was to get them to be able to do what's called a bent press. Mm -hmm. The bent press is a side, it's like a shoulder press, but you're in this kind of windmill side position. And if you train this, you can get tremendously strong. I mean, I know Eugene Sandel was able to do a bent press, in, that's a one-arm bent press, with something like 300 pounds. Yeah. It's well, crazy. it's partially, it's the, the raw strength of it, but it's more, it's a learning the technique of how uh, to stabilize it more by retracting your shoulder and being able to lock it in position. So now it's like, you, you know, you have this bulletproof shoulder that now I can then, you know, also use, you know, more, integrate more muscles in the lift, you know, along my, uh, you know, obliques and that, you know, all the way down to my hips. Well, I, I love that because as we get older too, for sure, one of the first things we lose is like rotational strength mm -hmm. because we just don't do it. As a kid, you play and so you're all over like the transverse plane and you do that uh, naturally playing on the the playground or playing sports yeah but probably one of the first things that people lose is rotational strength and uh i love the women i was going to suggest uh the turkish get up mm. uh we had a debate i think with one of our good friends who's really really smart about you know he, he cracks on uh the turkish get up now of course he's young and super super strong and and it hasn't probably dealt with a lot of elderly people and I think of just the ability to get up from the ground like that and mm -hmm. to just in your point with like rotational strength and be able to lock the shoulder in a place and stabilize like you kind of get all of that too with a Turkish get up. And I think I mean, how many of you guys ha or how many times have you guys trained a uh, advanced age client and the workout was like teaching them how to get up off the floor. Sure. Yeah. That and would be a whole workout. Time. Right. So uh, it's, and, and it's, and it's fun because you can really, as you get good at it, if you're younger and you're not, you're not 70 and thinking like that, you're just, Hey, what's a great movement that has lots of carryover and benefit. What a fun exercise to progress and get to the point where you're really strong, where you can hold a hundred plus pounds mm -hmm. over your head while you get up off the ground. And man, it, yeah, it's not going to make you have the best, you know, the heaviest bench press or deadlift or squat in the gym, but the overall control, body control that it takes to do that, and that what that has for overall health carryover and feeling good. Man, I love that. Yeah, no, Turkish getup has a lot of value. I don't know if I'd consider it forgotten just because it was forgotten, and then people started doing it because mm -hmm. it was very, it was a popular movement among uh, Turkish wrestlers and grapplers, I would and, say and nobody did it. I would say it's forgotten. You think uh, people start stop I mean, doing it? When's the last time you saw someone do it in the gym? Well, I'll tell you what, way more now yeah, than, never than 20 years ago. Well, what's way more? Once every six months you see it? Yeah, still. Yeah, right. Still. I mean, once every six months for guys who live in a gym yeah. to see I someone. I do trainers more. doing it. You yeah. know, yeah. The, the ones that are, you know, like all about kettlebells and know all this. Like, yeah, it's very, training. very rare. It needs to be done for sure. It's, yeah. it, but what I mean is 20 years ago, I didn't even know what a Turkish getup was. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, and I was a trainer. It was yeah. something that here's another one that um, I don't see too many people doing. You'll see martial artists do it sometimes, but there's a lot of value 
for just the average list, lifter. Now we used to call them dive bomber push-ups. I'm not sure oh, yeah. what other names yeah, uh, there I call are for them. That too, yeah. But these are push-ups on the ground. You take a wider stance and you lead with your head, and then you kind of scrape your chest and stomach on the floor, and then press your upper body up. Yeah. Um, and the the finishing the finished position looks like uh, in yoga they call it up dog. Mm -hmm. And then you go back to your butt being in the air, and then you do it again. You do what's called yeah. Called they dive used to actually have like a little wooden handle that like was made. I'd, if you look it up, um, I know they're like trying to bring that back in terms of like some of the old unconventional type tools. And it's literally just a bar that you hold on, and, and that's the exact movement you do over it mm -mm. next question is from that fly guy i'm a hard gainer and have read your hard gainer guide my issue is still getting enough calories while not eating junk would you recommend a weight gainer if it's from a great company like legion I feel like okay. this is like one of Mike's guys that works yeah, for him. Yeah. I feel like we got <laughs> Should I try a yeah, weight gainer like this great company Legion <laughs> yeah, makes for you? Yeah. So um, <laughs> uh, Hard Gainer Guide is available for – it's still available and it's free. So it's basically a guide that helps people who are, have trouble gaining muscle mass. That's at uh, mindpumpfree.com. Now, now, here's the thing with eating junk. I, I know how hard it can be to eat – adequate calories to gain muscle when you are somebody who burns a lot of calories, either because you have a fast metabolism or because you have a very active life. I know the struggle. Now, those of you who don't know what that struggle is like, you're listening and you're thinking, oh, I would love that. That's such an awesome problem to have. I wish I was always greener. Yeah, side. it's it sucks. It's hard. You're feeding yourself and feeding yourself and you're not putting on muscle and it's like, I can't eat anymore. So there are certain tricks of the trade that will help you do that. Now, Part of that is seeking out hyper palatable foods. Now, this doesn't mean you eat junk food necessarily, but junk food definitely has more of a place with a hard gainer than it does with someone who's trying to lose weight because junk food does a very good job of getting you to eat more calories. Um, it's tasty, so it makes you want to eat more. So the kinds of junk food that I like to eat when I was trying to gain that isn't super unhealthy. It's like I would make my own French fries and I'd use olive oil, for example, put them in the oven, hyper palatable salad. It's salty. I could get my carbs and starches that way. Or I'd get, I'd make a bowl of rice and put a bunch of soy sauce in there and maybe some butter or something like that. Give me some extra calories or cook the rice with bone broth to add the proteins. So there's a, there's definitely some value into eating things that are hyper palatable when your problem is not eating enough food. Now is drinking your calories a good strategy? Absolutely. Actually, one of the easiest ways to boost your calories uh, when you're when you're struggling and you're hitting what you feel like is your ceiling is to drink your calories along with the, the stuff that you eat. A weight gainer is one way to do that. You could make your own weight gainer as well. You could use things like whole milk. And, I prefer that. You know, mm -hmm. uh, you're, you're, but here's the thing. Protein sources tend to be an issue. Like, How do you increase the protein content of making your own gainer? Typically, you'd use a protein powder. Unless you want to do what I did a few times, which I only did it a few times because it was gross, which is blend up chicken breast. It's just <laughs> disgusting. Well, I used was to that part of the monster mash thing, like the vertical diet? No, uh, no, I, I, not in a blender. Okay, oh, that was yeah. terrible. I never had a lot of success with weight gainers. Uh, I, and I did all the crazy. In fact, it, most of the time, whenever I take a weight gainer, just to give me the shits afterwards. Yeah. Mm, like that, uh, I feel like I was like, horrible, man, horrible gas. Yeah, I'm like, I just drank that and I feel like it literally just came out like 30 minutes later. That's how I felt. Now, uh, I've actually never used Mike's, uh, you know, weight gainer, so I don't know what what it's like. But here's here's my strategy when I was bulking, and this is like, uh, you know, really new for me. As I mean, really uh, close to when I was just doing this, right? So when I was competing and trying to put mass on, and I was training at the volume I was, I was eating north of five thousand calories, and that's really hard to do all clean. So I had my uh, targets of where I what I wanted to hit from like all whole natural foods. So it was about 35, in order to get my protein intake, a good amount of good uh, vegetables and greens in my in my diet, I needed to hit, you know, roughly about 3,500 calories of like whole natural foods. And then what I allowed myself, that's when I would allow myself to go outside of that. And so I know Sal is, you know, giving examples of things that you would make. I was lazier than that. I would order five guys and fries. Like that would, that's, I would, that would be my, how I pile on the calories later on to hit my 5,000. I'd go 3,500 of eating clean, my made prep meals. And then once I hit my target, then that, the way I rewarded myself was I would allow myself to have more, 
you know, uh, palatable foods that I really, really enjoyed. Yeah, so yeah. I, now I got, I pulled up, so I didn't know he even had a weight gainer. The, the products that, uh, that I'm most f- familiar with from Legion are pulse and, uh, their protein powder. Uh, but he does have a weight gainer. So here's the difference. The weight gainers that we took when we were kids, cause I took those same weight gainers at him and the same thing happened to me. Uh, they gave me the, the, you know, they gave me liquid poops. What? Uh, how many calories was your were those weight gainers? Remember? Oh, dude, some of them were like, like 900, 900, yeah, 900 calories. Packed full of just sugar and shit. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so one serving of his gainer is 370 calories. Okay. Oh, wow. It's not even that high. No, it's it's definitely like a small meal, but it's... And this is why I like Mike. He doesn't make shitty... You know, he's not trying to make shitty products. He's just 50, higher fat probably. Well, then, huh? 51 grams of carbs, 38 grams of protein, and then the ingredients are... are, are are good. Uh, the protein is coming from you know whey, casein, and the carbs are from things like potato starch, oat flour. You know he's putting flaxseed in there and stuff like that. So not a bad not a bad choice in terms for especially for convenience because making your own can be different. Drinking calories definitely is a good strategy though. Here's an easy way to do it by the way. If you want to do the simple, 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 how do I drink more calories into my diet? If you're not uh, intolerant to dairy, if you're totally cool with dairy and you can drink milk, drink a glass of whole milk with mm. every meal. You know, that's easy. That's an easy way to add like 500 calories to your whole diet. It's just with, <laughs> with breakfast, lunch, dinner, and your meals in between, drink water. And at the end of your meal, take a big glass of whole organic milk yeah, I I mean, and just drink it. I mean, in the bodybuilder community, I mean, this is how we all, we all fall in love with peanut butter, man. That's how oh, like, so <laughs> peanut butter is the jam. My, my homemade, my homemade shake. Peanut would, butter is not the jam. It's yeah, yeah. Peanut butter. Yeah. Then no, my, jam. my homemade shake would be a, a way, and I used almond milk. I didn't even use, I could have got more calories if I used whole milk, but, uh, you know, too much dairy does bother me. I can have some of it, like my whey protein I can handle, but Lots of milk, ice cream. If I'm doing too much dairy, it definitely uh, it definitely affects me. So I was using almond milk, which is hardly anything, but man, it, yeah, and whey, which is not a ton of calories. But I've got in there. I've got uh, two tablespoons of peanut butter, one tablespoon of Nutella. Uh, I add in like a, a quarter cup of egg whites in, in addition to that, and then I used to take uh, um, hazelnut ground coffee and then pour that in there and then blend that all up. And man, that's a it ends up being a pretty high calorie shake still, and it's phenomenal. And well, you throw a banana in there too for an extra 120, 130 calories. Dude, so here, this is what I did. This was what I did back when I uh, and that shake that shake did down, sound delicious. Here's what I did when I was a kid before I could. This is when I could have milk. I can't do this now. It would totally destroy me. I wouldn't need to anyway. I don't have any issues bulking anymore. I'm older now, and for whatever reason, I can gain weight uh, far easier than when I was a kid. But I would did I did the milk thing right the whole milk so and I looked up the macros and now yeah. one a sixteen ounce which is a big glass of whole milk right sixteen yeah. ounces that's two hundred and seventy two calories wow fourteen grams of fat twenty grams of carbs fourteen grams of protein so you tell me if you add three glasses of that with breakfast lunch and dinner yeah you're looking at almost a thousand calories yeah and it's milk yeah. you know what I'm saying and yeah, it's got protein it fat and carbs. The problem is some people like 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 you and I can't digest it that well. But. Yeah. Well, you remember that there was a I think there was like a little thing that was going around for a while. I know there's articles around that that we were talking about all the the post workout shakes and talking shit about it, and they were talking about how one glass of milk is just they studies show that it's just as yeah. valuable as someone going Isn't that and funny? buying some. It's like the same macros. <laughs> no. Go ahead. Oh, you know what I was thinking of was uh, the whole Rocky thing where like people would start taking like raw eggs. Like, uh, I dude, I totally fell into that for a while trying to like, you know, be, you know, as savage as possible and gain as much weight as I could. I would throw like raw eggs and just like every shake and, and then in my mouth and try uh, to make that work. I did the same thing. But have you, did you actually drink the eggs by themselves? Did yeah. Did you ever crack them and drink them? Yeah, by- I did like three to four. I would like put in, in a cup and just down the Oh, hatch. I did that Whoa. once. One time. It's the worst feeling in the world. It's oh, terrible. so slimy. One more note, though. I want to say this. Yeah, I have something I want to give to this person. Oh, okay. So too. sometimes when you're a hard gainer, it's not because you're not eating enough calories. Sometimes your workout sucks. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's true. And mm-hmm. if you send... Here's the thing. I'll tell you what. It's, I used to, I, I had this debate with someone a long time. We're like, no, it's just about calories. It's okay. Uh, if I gave you anabolic steroids right now and you had no extra calories and you did the same workout, do you think you gained muscle? And they said, well, yeah, you probably would. You gain a little bit of muscle. So there's a lot of signals that tell the body to build muscle. And the main one is your workouts. And if you're not gaining muscle, sometimes it's because 
Your workouts are not effective. Well, a lot of times, a lot of times people are following. I mean, how common is that, that you're following kind of the same type of a routine? Yep. You know, yeah, I change up the reps or this and that, but you, t- people typically kind of uh, gravitate towards like the same type of routines. But I, w- I want to give some other really good tips that help me because this was like a fucking decades I was f- this was a struggle for me this <laughs> I'm, so like, glad I, I'm so glad I didn't know you back then yeah, you we would have we would have killed ourselves oh I'm sure we and we and I've done it all <laughs> yeah. everything from setting alarms in the middle of the night so the things that worked the best for me later on after all the things that I tried um I learned that um if I ate stuff that was really high calorie, like, like so, a lot of times what happens if, if you uh, you know that you need to have junk food or you need to add more you know palatable foods uh, in order to hit that calorie intake, you I would make the mistake of doing that for lunch. For example, I'd have like a big Quiznos and chips and like a soda or something for lunchtime. <laughs> Problem with when you eat those. Oh, yeah really palatable foods like that and you stuff yourself is then you're full for like four to five hours and when you're trying to ma- eat 4,000 5,000 plus calories and you're trying to trying to gain like that and you're struggling and you get and you get eat something that satiates you for that long you get behind on the calories you can't so I, I learned early on that if I ate leaner cleaner whole foods natural foods early, I, I found I could eat every two hours. Or so my body digested it fast. I was ready to eat again. And I, even if I wasn't hu- starving or hungry, I could eat again, another good three, 500 calorie meal, like every two hours. And this is where the every two hours thing I ha- has value. When you have to try and eat 4,000 calories, dividing that up in just two or three meals is fucking daunting. But if it's broken up in these like 500 calorie meals, every few hours, it's a little bit easier. So that strategy worked really well by eating leaner, cleaner, whole foods throughout the day mm-hmm. so I could consistently eat every two hours. And then, like I said, if I if I hit my targets, if I stayed to stayed the course, I ate all my meals that I prepared, my reward to myself was, oh, now tonight I'll allow myself to have the burger or I'd allow things like yeah. pizza and the diet or I'd allow these shakes that have Nutella and peanut butter. I would allow these types of you know, hyper palatable foods to pile on later on to make sure that I hit the caloric intake. That really works. You're for right. Me. You're right. And you don't want it to backfire either, right? Eating too much junk food, your health starts to go south. Your digestion goes south. You can kiss your gains goodbye. Mm-hmm. Um, so always consider health. Uh, you want to gain as healthy as possible because that's going to give you the longest uh, road to good lean gains. If you do it in an unhealthy way, it's not going to work for very long, and it'll backfire. It can backfire many different. It did it to me once. One time, I ate a whole bucket of KFC chicken because I was trying to trying to you know bulk or whatever. Yeah. I can't eat KFC chicken ever again. I, I eat so much of it, it grossed me out. Yeah. And I remember that whole day I ate nothing else. I didn't eat much the next day because I messed that up my digestion. Fat just dripping down. Your I arms. smelled like chicken. Yeah. The next day, I was sweating. No I've joke. Done, I've done the same. And people like, did you just eat KFC? Yeah, like, dude, there's, I there's ate, no shame. I ate it yesterday. <laughs> Next question is from Catherine B. Fit. What is the minimum macro calorie intake you would like to see an individual at before they enter a cutting phase? What would you consider ideal? Oh, this is different from person to person. It's I mean, we can it, go general, I guess. Yeah, yeah I mean, I, I think I picked this question when we were going through them because I think it'll create a good discussion. But the truth is, this is very individual, right? Like the, But there are some general rules, like, you know— uh, it'd be very common that I would get a female client that was coming to me that is only, you know, 10 to 20 pounds overweight and they come to lose weight. And then when I look at their diet and they, it, because what happens when they hire a trainer, they, or they seek someone like me out, they've already been trying lots of things on their own and they've been frustrated. And now they're coming to me. It's like, okay, I'm finally going to pony up the money to invest in a professional to help me. And the unfortunate part is I've got them after they've already fucking yo-yo died a bunch of time. They've already been restricting calories and they come to me and they're like, Hey, I'm only eating 1300 calories a day and I can't lose this last 15 to 20 pounds. I'm trying to lose, you know, what do I need to do? And that person, I don't, I don't want to cut from there. I, I like to get, I like to get most of my female clients above 2000 calories, uh, at least. And that's, that's a, that's a very gray generic answer. But I feel that that falls in the category of anybody from about 130, 30 pounds all the way up to 200 plus pounds. I want them above 2,000. As a female, I want to mm-hmm. get them to where they could eat 2,000 calories, not put on body fat. Even if we're just staying the same, we're not losing any weight, but we're strength training, we're able to consume 2,000 calories and not put body fat on. 
uh, that's where I want you to be before I start to pull you back, at least that before I pull you back to uh, the other direction. I mean, uh, in an, an ideal world, uh, I'll use uh, Melissa Wolf as an example, since she was the last like real competitor that I coached, and she's only about 120 pounds. I moved her all the way up to 2,700 calories mm -hmm. before I brought her back down. So the truth is, the the higher I can get somebody's caloric intake up, maintenance calorie intake up before we cut, it just gives us lots more room to work with on the way down. And it and what it, it hopefully ends up happening, and like in her case, getting on stage to compete, ripped as shit, and only having to cut down to 1,800 calories, which is a is a very happy place for a lot of people to be at. So you got to keep that in mind that wherever you are currently right now that if you're at a place where you already feel like you're not really eating a ton and you want to start cutting you know you're going to land in a place that you're you're going to feel like you're always restricting and you don't want to be there yeah the the individual aspect of this is really how how comfortable are you uh at the calories that you're going to settle at eventually so how comfortable would you be maintaining your body weight at 1500 calories or you know 1300 calories or 2000 calories that's an important question to ask yourself because some people are okay. Some people don't have big appetites and they're like, yeah, I'd be, I'd be fine you know, living off of 1,400 calories. So the amount of calories that you're consuming basically will keep you at the same weight. That's what maintenance uh, calories means. So when you're dropping your calories to lose weight, eventually when you get to your ideal body weight or body fat percentage, now you're consuming your maintenance, but you've had to cut to get there. So what you don't want to do is start at you know fifteen hundred calories, get down to a thousand calories. Now you're where you want to be. Right now you got to live at a thousand calories all the time. It's a very very difficult thing to do and very very common. This is what happens a lot of times. It is, but it, but for some people it's okay, but usually not. It usually isn't okay. So I typically I'm, I'm right along with Adam. I'd say for for women, I like to get them above two thousand calories. It's awesome if I can get them at like twenty four hundred calories. For a man, I'm trying to get him above 2,500 calories, usually around 3,000 calories. I was is where say, I'm happy. For a man, I'm looking for north of three. Yeah, and and when I get to that point, then I can start to cut uh, the calories and get them to get their bodies to burn. Body and keep fat. in mind, I know there's some tool that's listening right now that's fucking. Oh my god, that's so. That, that's, this is generic advice. Right, right, right. Like right. no doubt, there there's many variables. How much that person is moving, how much lean body mass oh, yeah. they have, their training routine, like. Of, I'm talking but, about regular activity. You exercise a few days a week. You, right. You have a normal desk job. And we're trying to give you an idea, all right? So this person, I mean, we're doing our best to answer this question without knowing all those things. So, you, so if you know that you're somebody who's probably in that extreme, it's like, you know, if you're a, a female, it's probably good to be somewhere in north of 2000 before you start cutting, especially if you know that you have, you know, and that's another thing that matters too, like, are we cutting for to lose five pounds or are we cutting to lose 30 to 40 pounds? Yeah, because then you got a long way to go. Right. So the, the, the bigger the number that you need to cut and restrict, the higher you're going to want your calories at currently to before you come back the other direction because – you know, it's only going to take a, a few weeks before the body gets adapted to that new uh, caloric maintenance. And so you got to keep that in mind that you may have to restrict multiple times. It's not like, you know, a lot of times people, they have a, a goal and they're like, oh, okay, well, if I restrict calories from, you know, 2000 to 1500, uh, I'm going to, and I just be consistent with that. I'm going to lose weight. Well, yeah, you're going to lose weight, but eventually, uh, and this doesn't take but a, a few weeks, maybe a month or two tops. The body then adapts to that, and then and then where do you go? Yeah, then where do you go from there? And mm -hmm. if your goal is something beyond 10, 15 pounds, you have to know that that's going to take you a longer amount of time. So yeah. this is uh, you know a hard one to answer and be specific, but give you some general things or things that we think about before we now, decide. Now the best way to help this is lift weights. Lift right. weights, get stronger, build muscle. That uh, tends to promote a, a hotter, faster metabolism. It also it reduces the metabolic slowdown that can happen when you're reducing calories like Adam's talking about. Lifting weights is one of the best insurance policies you have against those things. And it's also one of the best insurance policies to ensure that you have a fast metabolism, which in today's day and age is a massive advantage. Next question is from Rebecca Munchrath. With my schedule, the only time I have available to go to the gym is either early mornings or really late evenings. I've always had my best feeling and progress in the gym during midday. Do you have any tips for success at these new time of day workouts? So number one, uh, accept it. 
So just accept the fact that you're you're going to be working out at a new time and it's not going to feel ideal. It makes it a lot easier. I work out uh, oftentimes at 6 a.m. in the morning and by no means am I feeling as strong or as driven or aggressive at 6 a.m. as I would be at noon, you know, noon or one o'clock, which is uh, ideal for, for me and for a lot of people. So I just accept it. It's a morning workout, whatever. The other thing is this. Over time, you start to get used to it and you actually get better. Yeah, you'll acclimate to it. Yeah, you actually get better at those those types of workouts. Um, your body starts to perform better. In fact, um, coaches for high level, super high level athletes start to time heavy, hard training practices right around Game when, time when they compete. Yeah, yeah because yeah. your body actually starts to get good at adapting and saying, okay, we're going to perform uh, at a high level at this time. And so then, you know, your, your game is at seven. So you train at seven, you practice at seven. And the, yeah. and the truth is it's uh, whichever one of these two you're going to be the most consistent at is what all studies show are the, is the best, uh, the different, I mean, th <laughs> yeah, this is a, a long, long question, or we get asked this question all the time for a very long time. I've been asked this, is it better? And there's lots of studies that have came out to try and show, Oh, this happens in the morning mm. if you do this. And at the end of the day, none of it matters. What matters is what would you be the most consistent with? Now, personally for myself, if I had to choose one or the other, because I'm the same way too as Sal, I mm. would way rather be noon or one. If I had to choose morning or evening, I have to choose morning because mm -hmm. late evening workouts fuck my sleep up. Yeah. Mm. I, it gets my adrenaline going and night times are already hard enough for me to come, uh, come down at. And so maybe once or twice I could get away with an evening workout. But if I'm consistently doing that, it, it makes it really tough for me to fall asleep. Now, if you don't have that problem and you sleep harder because you work out at nighttime, you could be someone who's like that, then that might be a great strategy for you. But if it's like me where it fucks your sleep up, then as much as I hate to get up extra early in the morning, I would have to make that 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 sacrifice, get up extra early to do my morning workouts. Yeah, I wonder about that. I wonder if, because I've heard of people that work out all the time, like late at night, and then they can go right to sleep after that. I wonder about the quality of their sleep, though. Uh, for me, I would definitely have to choose uh, the morning uh, because, you know, for, for me to expend that kind of energy and get myself, like, amped up uh, like that, because inevitably, whatever you're doing, like, after that, I have this, like, charge of energy that, uh, you know, like it promotes and propels me the rest of the day. So, uh, for to, to expand it all at the end of the day, the one benefit to that is like you're already alert, you're awake, you you feel like I feel stronger towards you know the the end of my day or sometimes right in the middle of the day specifically. Uh, so that's the benefit for me is like feeling that I am strong in those movements. But uh, to then interrupt the sleep thing, knowing how valuable sleep is in the whole uh, building muscle process, I, I don't know. No. Plus, the, in at night, there's just way more excuses. I, I just find that my day That's a good point. takes over. If I wake up before the day starts and start my workout, it's the first thing I do. I'm far less likely uh, yeah. to miss my workout. Oh, yeah, if course. I leave it at the end of the day, like everything You're starts, exhausted, yeah, some days. stuff starts to get in the way, and I just ate dinner, and I, I'm full, or you know, I'm tired, or the kids need this, and then before I know it, workout's not going to happen, or I got to leave everybody to go work out um, and you know, then they're complaining or whatever. Whereas if I wake up before everybody can't say anything, I'm going to do my workout, but whatever it doesn't really, here's the bottom line. The workout that is the most effective for you is the one you're going to do. Yeah. Okay. That's the bottom line. So working out in the morning uh, might not be ideal for you, but if, or at night might not be ideal for you, but if you're going to do it, if that's going to make you consistent, then that's the day. That's the time. Then that's the time that you pick. You don't you don't wait for those you know unicorn times to work out when you feel your strongest and best. If those happen almost never, you're going to get terrible progress. Your body's not going to respond very well because of the inconsistency. And with that, go to mindpumpfree.com and check out all of our guides. The hard gainer guide is there, but we have other guides as well. We have fat loss guides and guides on you know building your arms or working your midsection. Make sure you go check them out. Mindpumpfree.com. You can also find the three of us on Instagram. You can find Justin at Mind Pump Justin, me at Mind Pump Sal, and Adam at Mind Pump Adam.